Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back, my friends, to the BJJ Brick Podcast. This is episode 350. My name is Byron. I'm here with Joe and Gary. We've got a great episode. Jonathan Thomas, a fan favorite, is back. We're talking uh, lots of jiu-jitsu, competitive jiu-jitsu, training off the mat. That's very important during this uh, COVID-19 time. And uh, we get into a little bit of a discussion about steroids and uh, competitive jiu-jitsu. But I want to start this episode off with a quote from Mark Twain. Anyone who stops learning is old, whether they're 20 or 80. Anyone who keeps learning stays young. The greatest thing you can do is keep your mind young. And I love that with jujitsu because there's always more to learn. That's just, I think that's one of the rewards of jujitsu is ask anybody, ask world-class athletes, are you still learning? And they will say yes. They may have very refined games. They may have very uh, a lot of different skills and abilities. But there's always more to learn in certain areas of jiu-jitsu. Uh, Gary, have you seen that from, for yourself? No. Joe, how about yourself? <laughs> <laughs> no, Byron, uh, you are right. Uh, you know, that's that's really probably one of my favorite things about jiu-jitsu, besides the cool guys I get to hang out with um, and girls. But it's uh, it's a ever – you're always learning. It never ends. Um, you know, I think I've got something I'm, I'm pretty good at. And the next thing I know, somebody teaches me so much more to it. It's a never ending process, you know, very high level black belts say that, you know, they're still learning every single day. I don't think, you know, we can ever max out on jujitsu, on wrestling, on grappling, you know, on any of this, there's always a different way to put your hands, always a different way, you know, to have your weight, a uh, different way to off balance people. So it's, it's cool because we're always going to be learning. And today in my game, it's not that I learn a new move. It's that I learn a new way, you know, where to put my hand or, or, you know, just some concept that just makes a big difference. And, uh, you know, just love jujitsu because of that. But, you know, he's saying you're dead if you're not learning. Um, I don't know if that is totally true. Well, he says because... you're not young. Oh, okay. Keeps your Never mind, mind young. Yeah, keeps your mind young. That's perfect. I guess if you, yeah, but once you die, your your learning process largely stops. If yeah. You, go well, that way, Gary. Have a, <laughs> you have a major head injury. That that could also be the case, Joe. Let's take this away from Gary's <laughs> teeth. Uh, yeah, you know, you know what I thought when I read this is I thought that um, you actually can start to uh, feel like you're running out of things to learn if you are, you know, very narrowly focused. If you're a mechanical engineer and maybe you teach high school math on the side or something, you can you can feel like you're starting to exhaust that subject. And I think people like that often gain from um, getting outside of their core academic study and, and take some art classes or study history or, you know, something different. And I think that has a relation to jujitsu as well. I think that you can start to, to really may, maybe almost get burned out with just focusing on um, a certain vein of jujitsu or a certain game that you're good at. And it's good to get outside of that uh, take some wrestling classes. If you're not a footlock guy, spend some guy work some time working on that part of your game. Maybe even do some striking or some free running in your off time. I mean, sometimes just to wake the mind up, I think you got to get outside of uh, your main area of focus. It's my two cents. Joe, I think that was worth five cents. Ah, nice. That's how yeah. much Lucy charged, I believe. For uh... <laughs> <laughs> she charged you that much. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on, Joe. Peanuts. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh the, my. The, the comic strip. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> the tech, I didn't know where you were taking that thing. Uh, well, you know, you don't get a lot for five cents. Yeah, and, and not a lot of uh, people still read the comics. <laughs> well, Joe and I still do. Yeah. What was your favorite comic there, Joe? Man, I don't know. Peanuts was pretty high on the list. Um 
there was one called Zitz. Yeah. I don't know if you, if you guys remember that one, but uh, yeah, when I was a kid, we looked forward to getting that Sunday paper. It was man, that Sunday paper was great with the oh, comics. Man. Four four pages of comics, man. Yeah, in color, Joe. Yeah, I know in this color. Is, yeah. This is going off topic, Joe. But how long ago did you stop getting the paper delivered? Pro- probably close to a decade or so ago, Gary. Uh, bought- sure. You you went long. I mean, I will tell you, I stopped getting the paper delivered about two years ago. Really? Yeah, we yeah. we've we've been living in our current home for twelve years, I think. Yeah. And I want to say that two three years into it, we we gave up on the local paper. Our generation, I mean, that paper was, meant a lot to us. It was, oh man, uh, that that's where you found jobs. That's where you found yeah. used bikes for sale. Yeah. That's I mean, <laughs> everything. Yeah. yeah, the sports page was great. You know everything. I, I you know, I just grew up, uh, you know, paper lover. You know, love to get that newspaper. Yeah, they probably even have jujitsu ads today. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we need to bring it back. Gary's going to start that business venture right now. <laughs> Good luck, my friend. <laughs> uh, really? Yeah, he, he's the one guy who goes from podcasting to the newspaper business. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you know, but you could, in theory, if you go back in time, find a, an ad for a jujitsu gym in the paper. Uh, but but in today's day and age. You need to make sure you find the right gym for you. And if you're in your first year of grappling, we've got the audiobook for you. It's called Your First Year of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. It's eleven ninety nine. The money goes to help support support the podcast. It's just basically me sitting down with you, talking with talking with you about what to expect during your first year. Everything from finding the right gym for you. And I don't really have the newspaper as a resource, but uh, you got to find that right gym. You, it's going to be your home. You want to take some time. It's it's worth the effort of of uh, going around and and uh, doing a little bit of shopping. From that, you know, your first month of jujitsu, some benefits of jujitsu, techniques to focus on, and then of course uh, all the way up to if you want to compete, what that's going to be like and what to expect. So uh, that's kind of the audio book in a nutshell. It's a little over two and a half hours long, and there'll be a link to the shop in the show notes. Go check it out, my friends. Byron, I will tell you. That's how I found our first jiu-jitsu instructor. Um, not necessarily a newspaper. But yellow pages? I would, not even yellow pages. Um, you, you'll love this marketing idea. I went to Nola's Pizza to get myself a pizza oh, one yeah. day. And sitting there on the, you know, by the side of the cashier is like one of those little penny saver papers or yep. whatever. And, uh, and there was a little ad in there. I guess that's not the real paper, but that's where I saw it from. And uh, that piqued my interest. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. That's funny, Gary. You know how I, I met my first coach? No. We, we were in a doctor's office. And on the end table where the magazines are all stacked up, there was a stack of flyers. And it was like two two months free jujitsu lessons awesome. for kids. And I'm like, I got kids. And so that's how I got started. I took my kids <laughs> in for some classes. So. Yeah. I got but kids. Isn't that crazy? How we, you know, the, the unique way we were both advertised about jujitsu. You know, it's just, uh, it's kind of crazy, you know, back then versus today. Jujitsu is a lot more, uh, you know, relevant. The place Byron and I started at where he advertised, there was no sign on the building. It was in the back of a building. There was be no way you would drive by and see it. So it was just, uh, you know, I just happened to get that penny saver and uh, the rest is history. And speaking of old school, you know, the way things were done a long time ago when Gary and I were young, and that was a long time ago. Uh, you guys know where uh, Mark Twain got his name, Mark Twain? You know, that's obviously his real name. His no, his name's Samuel Clemens. Mark that Clemens. That's just... Sh- Shania. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Oh, okay, smart, smart guys. Uh, where, where'd Mark Twain get that pseudonym from? <laughs> uh, you mean Samuel Clemens? So, yeah. From I, I, Samuel L. Jackson? I thought I thought sure one of you guys would have the answer, I don't but I'll know. take a shot. I'll I'll take Hannibal, a shot. Missouri? I'll take a shot at it, Gary. Okay. So it's actually an nautical term that was used on the Columbia River on the or not the Columbia River, the Mississippi River, uh, on the boats back in the day. And they didn't have a depth sounder. And a lot of people think that let me back up a minute. A lot of people think that you've got a big wide river like the Mississippi and the channel runs right down the middle. So if you're in the middle, you're good. But actually the deepest part of the river goes back and forth from bank to bank and um 
you know, you got to know what the deep water is if you if you're going to uh, navigate a boat up there. Oftentimes on the banks, there'll be a hundred feet of what you think is water, but it's really just six inches of mud flats underneath. So you have to avoid that. And the way that they knew how deep a water they were in is they would have a kid up on the bow and he had a line with a heavy weight on it. And he would toss it up ahead. And when the line would get to the bottom directly below him, he'd start pulling it up and he'd count how many knots he passed on his way to the weight and that would tell you how deep of water you are in and the second knot was called twain and when you came past the first knot uh, uh, a quarter way past you'd say a quarter to twain that means you're a quarter way there and then half twain three quarters twain mark twain that means you had 12 feet of water under the boat which was kind of the controlling depth and that's what you needed to be safe so that's how the captain knew he was in the right spot in the river and if he knew he was coming up on a spot where the river the water uh, depth changed from the east bank to the west bank the guy would start getting shallower readings and then he would go to the other bank and long story short you, you had to rely on that guy for that information and i was thinking about um as training partners the feedback and the information we give to our training partners is really important that they all the time want to know that they're progressing, what they need to work on. Uh, for instance, is if you're rolling with somebody that's not as good as you, you're going to adjust your your uh, your effort level so that you guys can have a good roll. But when that person makes obvious mistakes, you want to exploit those mistakes because that's how they learn. That's that feedback they're getting. And so as training partners, we can't just be lazy and we can't just kind of give a half-ass roll and our training partners might not know how to interpret that. So I don't know what you guys think, but in this relationship, you've got a captain in the wheelhouse and a guy up there throwing the lead line, and there's got to be communication between those two. I think it's the same way with training partners. That communication comes in the way of exploiting mistakes that they make and whatnot. What do you think, Byron? I I am just in awe of what's happening right now, guys. Uh, I sent out an email uh, to, the, to you guys a little bit ago and just had Mark well, Twain worry. as the quote. We didn't read it. Yeah, and he just pulls <laughs> us out of this. Like, I am really impressed with what, what Joe's bringing to the table today <laughs> or to the ship. Uh, but that's that's a great uh, way to do that. You, using or you need your training partners to help you, uh, I guess, kind of steer your ship or tell you what you're doing right or tell you that you're doing something wrong or uh, either they tell you or they just show you or... Uh, you know, I always have the the idea if if I could if I catch uh, Joe in, in a guillotine cool if I catch him in three guillotines I need to be talking to him about what's happening um, and why he's eating guillotine so many times uh, and helping him out a little bit. Same thing if he's if he passes my guard once, sweet. If he does the same pass to me a few times in a row, uh, maybe maybe his passing is that much better and I'm just have a hard time dealing with that. But maybe I'm doing something pretty fundamental that's wrong and he he has an answer for me because. The odds are the person who's exploiting your weakness knows the answer to it. And uh, what a great opportunity uh, to, to learn from your training partners. And the example of Mark Twain, that's really cool, Joe. I'm impressed. It's a, we're a team. You know, the the boat, the the guy, the captain, the guy driving it, and the, the guy throwing the, the anchor in or whatever you call it, Joe. I'm messing all your terms up. You know, they like Joe said, they have to communicate. They have to have each other's best interests. They they want each other to get better. Um, same thing with uh, jujitsu. If I'm just passing your guard at will, am I getting better? No. Are you getting better, Byron? As I'm passing your guard at will, no. For us in that room as a team to get better, we all need to help each other out. I need to help. You know, Byron, why am I passing so easy? And like you said, Byron, I probably know the answer. You know, maybe it's just because Byron lays there like a wet sock and I just, you know, just pass at will. Maybe Byron needs to frame a little bit better. Maybe he needs to do this. But it's going to make Byron better. It's going to make me better. It's going to make our whole team better as we get better. You know, communication, as Joe said, is a big key uh, to get better, to make your team, you know, excel. Joe, your professional opinion here. If Mark Twain was born today, would he be called Depth Finder? <laughs> or Echo Sounder. <laughs> That's e- nice Echo's, Echo's a good name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you're right, Joe. It's crazy. I, I mean, uh, Byron, he, he blew me away with that. You know, I'm not I'm not privy to how people got names like John, 
you know, or Mark Twain. And the only person that really I'm kind of privy to of how they got their name is Byron. Uh Um, (laughs) You know, like, you know, when I used to always go out with my dog and uh, we'd go out and my dog about every 10 minutes would stop and take a Byron (laughs) for And, you know, or if I, you know, I'd always carry around, uh, you know, bags to pick up Byron's if I ran into any. But, you know, so like I know that's how you got your name, but I didn't know any other, you know, person, how they got their name. So it's kind of cool to find out somebody else's. Yep. Maybe next episode we'll learn the history of of a Gary. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I can't wait. (laughs) And how much that service cost uh, a lonely gentleman in the middle of the night. (laughs) (laughs) You mean Lucy? (laughs) (laughs) All right. Uh, It's going to be more than five cents. (laughs) We're going to... Take a break from our uh, and throw us to our sponsor, and then we'll uh, roll the interview. We all know our jujitsu works in the street, but have you ever asked yourself if your jujitsu would work in the jungle? Well, now I bet you can't get that thought out of your head, and there's only one way to find out. Introducing. Gary and Joe's Interactive Tiger Grappling Zoo. Here you'll find out if your Mataleon can stand up to a real lion, or if your leg lock game is good enough to catch a tiger by a toehold. Gary and Joe's Grappling Zoo now features a brand new belt system. Well, it's pretty much the same belt system, but for stripes, we use tiger stripes. For a limited time, get your Joe and Gary riding on a tiger tattoo for half price. Or just get the Gary tattoo for free. So come on down to Gary and Joe's interactive Tiger Grappling Zoo. Located between Gary's home in Kansas and Joe's home in Texas. That's right, for you geography aces, Oklahoma. Gary and Joe are not responsible for bumps, bruises, scratches, major injuries, including broken bones and bites from both Animal or Joe. The complete breakdown of your entire jiu-jitsu system, regrets about your Gary tattoo, dojo storms are not recommended, and have been the result of the death of the entire storm team. We'll see all you cool cats and kittens in the jungle. Hold up on buying those tickets, you cool cats and kittens. Gary and Joe's Zoo isn't sponsoring the BJJ Brick podcast. In fact, it's not even real if you can believe that. The BJJ Brick podcast is sponsored by the listeners just like you through our Patreon account. Check it out in the show notes, my friends. Thank you for your support. All right, my friends, I'm happy to bring back Jonathan Thomas to the BJJ Brick podcast. Jonathan, welcome back to the show. Hey, good to be back. What is it? I think it's my third time on. I think so. <laughs> I appreciate you. I was thinking about who would be interesting to talk to uh just kind of in this time where we're not getting our our normal training in and and who's always a good conversation and and you've also had some great uh ideas or or help with me anyway with with some off the mat training. And so I was like, you were on top of that list. I you know, I need to call Jonathan and and uh and catch up with you a little bit cuz it's been a little bit yeah, yeah, it has. I appreciate you thinking of me on this topic. So <laughs> that sounds kind of funny. With with uh, you know, COVID, we're recording this on April thirteenth. So and this won't air for a little while. Uh, planning to air this April twentieth. So if anything drastically changes between now and then, we don't know about it. But uh, yeah, you're, you're definitely on the on, on my uh, top of my list as far as people who. Um, who studied jujitsu and who are a student and then also a practitioner as far as a, a competitor. So, uh, you're also, you know, leading the way a lot of times on online, you have an excellent YouTube channel and yeah, Instagram and, uh, and, and a great presence online as well. So, uh, happy to have you back. Thanks. Happy to be here. So uh, tell us a little bit about if they haven't heard the past interviews, uh, kind of a quick Where'd you start jujitsu and where are you now, I guess? <laughs> Get us up to speed. Yeah. Um, so I started jujitsu in St. Louis, Missouri when I was 17. I'm 33 now. 
Uh, I trained at Rodrigo Vagis, which is kind of like a traditional Hicks and Gracie style gym. I trained there for maybe five or six years uh, or maybe like four years from white belt to purple belt. And then I trained at Alliance Atlanta HQ for four or five years. Uh, and then I won the pans and worlds at purple belt and brown belt in 2009 and 11. Then I was traveling, teaching seminars, got an offer to teach at a gym full time in Sweden. So I moved here, took the, uh, the job teaching full time. Uh, since then, I've started a YouTube channel and Instagram, and I kind of have like particular training uh, methodology that I find works best for me. And it, I think a lot of it has been built around the fact that I started in a smaller gym. So I have a lot of self-study, learning through watching competition video and like smart training in small groups and things like that is kind of how I always learned jiu-jitsu. So that's partly why I moved to Sweden as well, as I felt like I had more control over my training than when I was training at uh, some of the big gyms uh, like Alliance HQ and stuff. So um yeah, since then I started a YouTube channel, Instagram channel, and I kind of put out my ideas and training philosophies and techniques and stuff uh, and just share that. And uh, now I do a lot of like online coaching and webinars and things. That's kind of how I make my uh, income and, uh, you know, run my social media. And now I'm in Sweden and the coronavirus has hit and that's kind of where we're at. All right. <laughs> that was that was uh, very good uh, bringing us up to speed. Uh, one thing I caught on is uh, – the small gyms concept or maybe just small groups of people. Yeah. Can you describe that a little bit more with a little more detail? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think one thing to consider is when you're develop. let me think of where it's a good starting point. Um, when you're when you're trying to develop your jujitsu uh, at a smaller gym, it's always a bit different, right? Because you know you you're always limited by the responses that people at your gym do. So if you're training in the gym and you're working on your guard passing, but no one in your gym plays spider guard, then when you go compete, if someone puts you in spider guard, you're always going to be at a loss, right? So a lot of guys who train at like uh, big gyms like Autos HQ, Alliance HQ, or like AOJ or some big gym like that. Uh, you know, you may go into the gym and there's like, you know, 700 members of the gym and there's someone doing all different styles of jujitsu. So you can kind of go in and train normally and kind of get exposure to all the possible things you might experience in a competition. However, when you're training in a small gym, uh, like in the Midwest or like in Scandinavia now, uh, it's a bit different because you may show up to the gym and like, you may have a couple of really good guys even, but no one who plays worm guard. And if you're not putting in that like self-study time, analyzing video to prepare and train more intelligently, it's very hard to be prepared for a competition because guys are going to do things that you have no experience in. Uh, that's a big thing. Uh, also, when I first learned jiu-jitsu, a lot of it was self-taught watching the first UFCs and then like rewinding and watching. I taught myself my first arm bar that way and things like that. So I've always been very big on uh, self-learning, right? Um, yeah. So is there a lot of people train in smaller gyms and we look at these, uh, the, the big gyms you mentioned and like, man, that's where I would need to go if I want to take my jujitsu to the next level. Um, but there's definitely opportunity to, to, as far as studying and, and developing yourself as a martial artist that, uh, you may not need, uh, everybody playing, you know, like you said, the example of spider guard, you know, all these different types of things that can get thrown at you. But, um, it's just an interesting concept as far as th there are some clear advantages to training with a, a wide range of people. You get you get a whole bunch of different things thrown at you. You have to learn how to deal with that uh, versus I'm sure the students training with you in a, in a smaller setting uh, get excellent training. And, and maybe it's more focused on oh for sure developing I mean, their I own say... game versus developing how to react with other people's games. Is that – Yeah, I would say the biggest thing I try to focus on is like – uh, I'm going to I'll make this part short because I know a lot of people have probably heard me talk about this before, but is uh, I have uh, my foundation for understanding jujitsu is I break everything down by positions, right? You see a lot of people teach uh, jujitsu by explaining these broad principles and concepts where they're like always have posture, like always have 
uh, your arms tight, like never extend your arm. And they teach a lot of broad principles. And I actually found that I find that to be uh, not only uh, not effective, but uh, often counterproductive where it actually inhibits the student. Um, so the way I teach jujitsu is I break everything down by positions, right? So for example, you could be very good at finishing from the mount, like doing submissions from the mount, but absolutely terrible at playing the worm guard. They literally have nothing in common. They're almost they're probably less in common between those two skill sets than soccer and rugby maybe or <laughs> it's it's so different right so you could almost categorize these positions by different uh, as uh, different sports even right you could be a world champion at mount and a white belt at playing worm guard right of course there's some like carryover where like you know if you do an arm bar from mount or an arm bar from worm guard the end position of an arm bar you may be good at right but if you start to see jujitsu is just this combination of multiple mini games then it's way easier to understand because the problem with like the broad abstract principle methodology is that uh it you're all the positions are so uniquely different. Like you may be in one position and the most balanced way, like if you're looking for a broad overarching principle of balance, for example, the most balanced way to stand could put you in a triangle choke. Right. So then looking for this broad principle of balance and base may put you in a triangle choke in that particular situation. In another situation, uh, you know, uh, a normal, um, way of uh, balancing may get you ankle locked or may expose the guy to come up on a single leg. Right. Uh, you know, and then there's like things with like the lapels, like sometimes the guy will hold a lapel in a certain way. And normally that would be a good position in wrestling, but because of the fact that the guy has this lapel grip, now you can't break this grip and it allows him to take you down in a different way. So trying to look for these, broad principles can make it very confusing as you just start slow and categorize uh sub positions over time all of those positions come together to make your macro game so i call that micro and macro jujitsu micro jujitsu is your skill set in the individual positions macro is how you combine those right so for example if i was starting with like a white belt or just someone who just started i would go okay let's start with like an arm bar i'd have them start in the arm bar show them the finish mechanics and then slowly have them train with a partner who is resisting but starting from the arm bar then they learn the mechanics of okay the guy's defending the arm with his arm you know he's holding his hands he tries to roll out and they develop all the counters for how to finish that so that now if they just start in an arm bar they're actually good they may have no idea how to open close guard but they if they start in an arm bar they're good and if you just kind of piece by piece build positions like that like arm bar triangle choke a collar choke then you start with an uh, an overhook triangle choke setup but you start with the overhook and then you patch these things slowly over time your knowledge base of all these positions will start coming together as you have this mass of positions now macro jujitsu is more strategy like that's like okay i like when you start you don't uh the longer you train the more positions you're going to know well right um so uh, when you're competing at a lower level, like you've been training one to two, I, mean, I would say one to four years even, you can't know that many positions yet, right? So if I'm fighting uh, and I'm going to play on top, I can't, if I've been training a year, there's no way I'm going to be prepared for every possible guard type, right? Because it's just too much to prepare for. So winning in competition, especially at a lower level, is often about filtering the match to the positions that you know well. And that's what I call macro jujitsu. So for me, most of your training should be in micro jujitsu because that's improving your actual skill base. And how do I deal with the spider guard? How do I deal with the reverse deal of worm? How do I deal with the worm? How do I deal with the squid? How do I deal with the X card? So you have answers for all those positions. And then that's the micro. And then the macro is when I go into a fight, how do I choose to implement the skills that I have in an efficient manner? The reason I like this is anytime I have a match and something goes wrong, I can immediately uh, diagnose what went wrong. It's like, okay, I'm on top. I tried to pass. Uh, he established his, uh, his guard, like spider guard before I could pass. Okay. So I lost the grip fight. I could work on that. Now he gets me in spider guard. Okay. He puts me in a triangle choke and then finishes the triangle choke. So there I could go, okay, some, my spider guard knowledge needs to be improved because I couldn't win that spider guard battle. And once he got to the triangle choke, the triangle choke battle started. And then I also lost that. So I know I could patch any of those three, but like, let's say that, um, you know, I go to my guard and I get spider guard. I sweep him. I come up on top and go to the knee shield. And then I get stuck there the whole match. My spider guard's fine, but my knee shield needs to be patched. 
right? So I use kind of broad rolling, like normal rolls, as a way to diagnose what's wrong. But then most of my development is going deep in a position for hours. So if I need to work on, uh, if I have a two hour training session, uh, most of the time I'll just use that to go, okay, I'm going to spend two hours passing Spider Guard rather than just doing regular rounds. And then by the end of that, I've noticed all these subtle micro patterns that make me way better at dealing with that position, if that makes sense. Yeah. And in theory, your training partner is getting to, to work a lot on their spider guard. Oh, and, for sure. And both people improve a lot from that. Yeah. As, as you both grow together and, and, you know, if you're training with a blue belt or a pro belt and, you know, obviously you're a black belt, like you're giving them tips to help clean up their spider guard to make it better for you to try to pass. And, yeah. And that's a, that's a huge factor, actually, if you're training at a uh, smaller gym is like, and you're like one of the top guys there and you want to get better. You, uh, you often will have to put a lot of ground effort into building up your training partners. Cause if you want to prepare to pass the worm guard, no one plays worm guard. Well, the first thing you have to do is actually take one of those guys and teach them how to play the foundations of the position. But it's a lot easier if you start in the position and have them learn to fight starting in the position, they'll adapt very fast at learning how to at least be annoying. Yeah, versus having to to get the position and and earn that yeah, spot. Exactly, it's also more probably motivating for them to see the results sometimes of 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 playing that game versus you don't really see results when you when you set it up and you work really hard just right. to get the position. But yeah, I think that, that, that's all uh, very good stuff. Um, it, I, I like how your your concept of of teaching it as small as positions versus, you know, just big concepts that, that makes sense. I think as a, a student, you know, as, as, as we're all learning here, it, yeah, each, think, each position uh, is totally different and it, it helps uh, me learn that. Another couple thoughts along with that, that I've, uh, I think kind of evolved on a bit more recently, uh, at least in explaining it is that uh, the purpose of those like specific sessions is to increase your understanding, right? I think what most people do wrong when they're training is that they are trying to win all the time, which of course there is a time for trying to win. But when you do specific sparring like that, the, the purpose is to develop understanding. So um, I try to always, whatever training I'm doing, have a clear uh, goal with that training. So if the goal of this training session is to push my cardio, then I'm not going to be doing so much analyzing. I'm just going to be trying to move the whole time. Right. But for example, if I was treating it like it's a tournament, I actually wouldn't roll in the same way that if I was pushing my cardio, because if I'm pushing, if I'm in a tournament and I'm up by two in closed guard, I'm going to chill and just play it safe and hunt submissions and be careful. But if I'm, you know, down two and there's a minute left, then I'm going to go crazy. So rolling to push your cardio is a different goal than rolling like it's a tournament. And then rolling to try to improve your technical knowledge and understanding is a different thing than rolling to improve your cardio or rolling like it's a tournament or pushing your mental toughness. So you need to have a clear uh, intention behind your training. So for me, generally, I like, you know, maybe two to three times a week where I push my cardio a bit harder. Most of my training is all in skill development. Like I want to be uh, so technical that I can be like calm. Uh, out of shape and still win the match. I don't want to be relying on hard cardio and strength, especially if you have to fight people on performance enhancers. So I do a lot of my training where I'll get one on one with a partner and we'll just spend two hours. And it's a, uh, I use a lot of different, um, I use a lot of conversation in the training. So what I might do is like if I get with my one partner, we'll start off and we'll do like 20 minutes kind of light rolling, moving around to get warmed up. And as we find a position that's like a problem area, like say passing the collar sleeve guard, we'll go there and then I start trying to pass. And as soon as some problem pops up that I don't know how to deal with or I feel like it's giving me a hard time, I'll tell my partner, OK, stop, uh, go again, now go slow motion. And let's just go through this and we'll go kind of slow motion and I'll identify the exact spot where something's going wrong. I'll go, huh, I don't know what to do here. This is strange. And I'm identifying the problem. And then I may try, you know, change the grip and go, okay, now try to resist again, go. And then I test it. Okay. Now, now I change your grip again. I go, okay, now do this, go. Right. And I'm testing hypotheses and ideas to expand like how I solve the position. So I'm using a mix of like telling my partner to stop, freeze, 
go slow motion, go really hard, sometimes change their movement pattern so that I can increase my understanding of the position, right? But I think that's something that a lot of people don't do is they only go full speed so they don't have time to stop and diagnose what's e what is even happening. The first thing uh, to get better is to identify the problem before you can even uh, attempt to solve it. So I think uh, having training time set aside where you get with a partner and you kind of work on a position, whatever it may be, passing a position, playing a guard, and spending like an hour or two there uh, not only sparring, but being able to freeze and discuss and kind of troubleshoot issues is very important. If, if you were to put all your time with jujitsu, I guess, in like a pie chart, how much of that would be on the mat rolling, positional sparring, uh, studying video, and you know, like different categories? Like, are, are, yeah. Would you guess that so, something would surprise us on that uh, pie chart? Um, let's see. Well, I mean, I certainly watch a ton of video. The thing with watching video spar up uh, specific sparring and training on the mat is the is the bottom uh, bedrock of what makes you get better. Now, whenever you have a problem, you need to come up with a solution for that problem. OK, um, what's your solution to problems that pop up? They're a problem because you don't know the solution currently. Your solution for those problems is going to come from one of three things. It's going to come from creative thoughts like yourself just going, huh, what if I did this or like being creative to come up with your own uh, solution. Uh, watching competition video, so looking at another competitor and seeing what they are doing in the position, watching uh, like matches that they have and seeing them in that same position you're in and paying attention to what they do because you may identify a pattern that they're doing that could be useful for you. So that's the second one. The third one is talking to another competitor and asking them. Right. So like asking your coach or like asking someone else, you know, who's good at the position. All three of those are important because uh, especially as you get to a cutting edge in a position or if you're inventing a new position, uh, then there may not be anyone that even has the answer. So then you have to be creative. But it, other, uh, if, if it's a position that someone else has mastered, borrow their ladder, watch competition video of them and take what they're using to get you up to speed. Right. So I would say that the um, the off the mat stuff, like asking questions, watching competition video and creative thought uh, are just as important as the sparring, but they're an amplifier. If you're doing no sparring at all and only watching video, you can come up with ideas, but you can't test them. So you, you need the sparring. But at the same time, if you get like 100 percent better sparring uh, with no video and no analyzation and off the mat work, you may get 500 percent better by sparring and watching video. But if you just watch video and do no sparring, you're not going to get any better. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned a, a word that I guess uh, on this podcast, I really, we don't talk about much as like inventing or coming up with, with techniques or maybe a, a, a bit of a system. How, how do mm -hmm. you know when you're not just totally wasting your time on that? Like, you don't. Um, so that's the tricky part, right? Uh, this is why I always like look at like, if you look at like physics or science, the first thing people do when you get into physics, it, you start when you're like, you know, in grade school or elementary school, you start with math, right? You, you learn what people already discovered, right? So when you're in high school and you're learning calculus, right? You're like, uh, at, at the time when Newton created calculus, that was like, you know, which incidentally, I think he made during quarantine during the Black Plague. Um, the interesting thing, he invented all of that. That was the cutting edge of humanity when he made calculus, right? Or when he discovered calculus, rather, right? But now we learn it in high school, right? Because we're just borrowing that ladder. So as far as creation goes, you tend to want to borrow the ladder as much as you can in the beginning. There's no reason to reinvent the arm bar when there's people who have, you know, 50 years of experience in jiu-jitsu. You could just learn the arm bar from them, right? So borrow the ladder as much as you can in the beginning, um, the, the tricky part with, uh, asking coaches is some coaches, uh, may, may even be great competitors, but they don't know how to articulate what they do well, or they can't organize it. So that can make it tricky. So then you can talk to them, but they may show you wrong, right? So they may show you something and you're trying to force it and then it may end up not working right in this, in the correct way. Cause they didn't explain it correctly or they missed a detail. When you watch competition video, you know, it works cause you're seeing it happen versus someone who did not want it to work. So that's why I like competition video so much. Um, so 
Uh, I always say pick a position that you know works. Like if if a spider guard, right? You know it works because like Felipe Andrew just subbed uh, Keenan Cornelius with it. Um, you know, Michael Lange used it for years. You know that thing works. So if you know it works, then if it's not working for you currently, you just don't – you're just doing something wrong because you know it does work, right? So borrow that ladder for a bit. Then when you want to start getting more creative uh, – and I guess there's a creativity in – learning how to do what Michael Lange does, for example. There's a creativity in trying to figure it out yourself by watching him. Uh, but I mean, when you're being very creative, like inventing something completely new, um, that's just uh, trial and error. You come up with an idea, you test it, have the person resist 100%. And then if you can do it on them 100%, then try it on other training partners at 100%. If you start hitting it in class all the time on everyone and it's working, then you go to competition and test it on like high-level competitors. If it's working there, it's pretty, it's pretty good. It's working, right? But I would say that uh, people often have this idea where like they think if they're trying to learn something and they come up to a – something that they work on something for a month and then they end up with something that doesn't work that they wasted their time. They did not. As you are learning what does not work, you are eliminating things that don't work and getting yourself closer to things that do work. Uh, I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions in jujitsu is people think that like there's a right way to do things. There isn't, there's just movements and outcomes and it depends on how you do things. So, uh, I, th I think people need to embrace this idea of, okay, I'm going to learn collar sleeve. I'm going to work on it for two or three weeks. I'm going to stay in the collar sleeve position and spar from there with my partner. We start there. If he passes or gets out of the position, we stop and go back and start over. If I sweep or submit, we stop, we go back, we start over. And then you just spend like uh, an hour or two there one day. And then after that, you go home, you watch competition video of someone sparring and uh, collar sleeve, find a really good collar sleeve player like Tommy Langer or Nicholas Mergali. Uh, and then you come up with, take notes on little things you see them doing and ideas, and then go back and test some of those ideas. When you train again in the position, take notes on like things that were giving you a hard time, ideas, and then test those things. Uh, and I would say most of the time, like 80% of the ideas I come up with end up not working, but 20% do. So don't think that when you're testing new ideas and trying things out, that if it doesn't work, you're just wasting your time. That is 100% uh, necessary to learn positions. Uh, I've probably come up with more dumb ideas than anyone in jiu-jitsu. But that's also why when I explain positions, I'm so thorough and in-depth is because I've spent so much time being wrong. Uh, th 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 those are just interesting uh, statements that that you're making. I th the <laughs> the the most I think common time I see somebody that <clears throat> like inventing or working on something that they've come up with. It, let's just say an example of a, a blue belt. Hey, look, this, this is working great. Well, you're tapping out white belts with this. Let's try it on somebody who's a little bit more advanced, and then it just yeah. falls apart completely. Is is that? Are they just too new? Should they just be borrowing that ladder at that phase still? Or is just some people are just more yeah, creative? Yeah, I mean, you, you have, there's a couple of things you have to balance out. You have to balance out passion for the person. Like if you make it, if they don't like doing that, then they're not going to want to train. If they stop training, then they're, they're not going to get better at all, right? So I never want to like kill someone's uh, passion. So there may be positions that I don't like, but if, it, if it's got the guy so motivated that he wants to come in every day because he's like super inspired by it, then I'm not going to tell him no, right? However, I will try to explain to the student that like, you know, I, I always think uh, uh, Naval Ravikant, I don't know if you've ever heard him, he was on Joe Rogan, I really like him. He was talking about like a lot of solutions to problems come through uh understanding as you understand things you'll kind of fall into the right things so i would never tell the student don't do this but i would explain them like ba i would basically explain what i told you i'd be like look the position you're playing here it may or may not work it could end up being the greatest thing ever created in jujitsu uh it could end up just being something that doesn't work at all if you spend the next two months putting uh, like you know let's say you train 40 hours a month you spend the next two months you spend 80 hours working on this thing it may or may not end up working out Right. You don't know if that's going to because it may not pan out and do an effective thing. There's no way to know beforehand. So if you put a ton of effort into it, you may get two months down the line 
and have spent 80 hours that you could have invested in something for sure that works, like finishing a single leg takedown, which you don't know how to do right now anyway. So you might as well get good at that and borrow the ladder from people that have already done it until you get good at that. And there's a creativity and fun of that as well. However, if you're just super passionate and motivated by this, then by all means do it. I don't want to ever take away someone's passion. But I think usually explaining it in that mechanic of efficiency usually makes people go, yeah, like, like I don't want to spend 80 hours on this and not do it. But sometimes I think as you get higher level, you get to a, a point where you know a position so well, you know almost everything that even the top guys doing in that position. That's where pushing the boundary and creating becomes more relevant because you have to sol- solve things, you know? Yeah. Uh, you, man, I, you're a great coach. <laughs> the, the discussions Thanks, that you bud. have with your, with the, with your students like that, that's, I'm learning from you in that respect as well. Uh, you you mentioned I'd like to where this is going here. You mentioned uh, Newton uh, working on calculus and making great gains during the Black Plague, and yeah. and, and now we're talking about creativity and jujitsu. Now at this time, jujitsu is basically nobody is training right now, um, as far as going to a large gym and and getting yeah. in at times. Like, do you think that there are a lot of the the top competitors or a lot of uh, people are are developing? new things in jiu-jitsu and maybe a few of those will really really take off well um i mean i guess it depends on uh the individual and how they approach jiu-jitsu it depends as well on uh i guess their situation as far as quarantine goes like if you're isolated completely alone that's a different thing than if you're isolated with one person or if you're somewhere where you have access to two or three people that you can work with right Um, In Sweden, they're having a very laissez, like a hands off attitude about the coronavirus. So like restaurants are open, cafes are open, uh, like there's people outside right now sitting at cafes. They're they're not doing anything. Um, They shut down bars and they made a recommendation that people don't uh, get together in groups. But uh, most of the Swedes (laughs) seem to not care so much. So they it's like business as usual here. but uh, so but for me, I, I stay in. I'm pretty careful. I don't go out and eat at restaurants or anything like that. But I have like a core group of like four or five friends that also are very careful. And we have a little training group that we'll train with. Right. So I'll have them come over and I can do like training. Usually it's with one person or two people max at a time. Uh, and then we just do like little group training for like two or three hours working on positions. So for me, I feel like I'm benefiting more during this time than normal because I have so much more time to just go one on one with someone really deep in a position. And then when I change partners like the ne- at night or the next day, I get to test versus different patterns and things. So for me, it's I'm I'm doing OK. Now, if you're not the kind of person who has kind of a cerebral approach to jiu-jitsu and you're used to just going pohada and, and like juicing every day and you don't have access to that and you have like one partner who's like half your size, you're really going to uh, struggle with this situation or you're going to evolve the way you think about jiu-jitsu. But supposing you don't evolve the way you think about jiu-jitsu, I think you're going to really struggle because you're used to the only way you improve by just going super hard all the time, right? Uh, and now you, you won't have access to that, so you really have to dig deep uh, mentally in the positions. Um, but I think the big question most people are probably asking is, if they wanted to improve their jiu-jitsu, what is the most efficient thing they could be doing with this time period so that when they can, when things do go back somewhat to normal, that they have used their time ty- time the most efficient way possible right um first off i think solo drills maybe for people who are brand new and stuff could be cool but for the most part that's not going to help you much i just you know i know people don't want to hear that but but it's just not um you, you if you don't have any way if you can, even if you're like with your wife and she doesn't train jujitsu i think if you're watching competition video and you can get her to kind of work with you and like you kind of just like go slow and show positions you could still get a lot done but if you have absolutely no partner you are locked in alone and that's it then I think the best thing you could honestly do is work on your strength and your flexibility. That's something that is really hard to work on when you're training jujitsu a lot because your body's so beat down from training jujitsu, it's hard to make big strength gains. So I think the best thing you could be doing right now is use this time to allocate things such that when you come back, you're better prepared and uh, maximizing your strength training and your flexibility is by far the best thing you could do if you're absolutely alone. Uh, great advice all around. It's interesting to hear what you're doing. Uh, as far as flexibility or strength training, any general recommendations? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I'm always a big proponent of like uh, just strength over. I see a lot of people doing like I want to get. Um, this is not my expertise, but I'll just speak a little bit about what I do. Um, I see a lot of people doing a lot of like more conditioning stuff where they're doing like battle ropes and like all sorts of stuff like that. Um, but maximal strength is kind of the thing that translates most over and everything else. If you take an Olympic gymnast or maybe not even Olympic, if you take a high level strength person who's very strong for their body weight, be it powerlifting or gymnastics, someone just is very strong per, per pound of body weight or per kilogram of body weight. If you're in Europe, uh, then, uh, that person's going to do well at everything. If you want to be able to do like high repetition, regular pull-ups, then just do weighted pull-ups or do like one arm pull-up progressions that will make you better at that. So I always focus on like high strength or high weight or high difficulty and low rep. So like five sets of five, five sets of three, three sets of five, things like that. And I always do like full body, like compound stuff. So like, you know, front levers, if you know what that is, deadlifts, squats, uh, handstand pushups, overhead press, bench press, uh, you know, uh, rows, pull-ups, um, all those kind of things, uh, core stuff like L sits, ab wheel, uh, that, that kind of stuff. And I'm always doing like high weight, high strength, uh, like that. And there's a lot of different programs you can do, um, for body weight strength training, uh, gymnastics bodies is really good. Um, overcoming gravity is a great book on, uh, body weight strength training, uh, weights I used to be into back in the day, but I mean, I think five by five, uh, you can find a lot of stuff on that. Um, I think, uh, for flexibility, um, GMB fitness is really good. They have a lot of like simple stuff you can do to start building up mobility, flexibility, uh, book stretching and flexibility by Kit Laughlin is really good. Um, uh, yeah. And then for flexibility in general, I think a lot of people try to do it. They make it too hard. Don't overstretch. Don't like try to push too hard. Just kind of like every day, just do like 10 minutes and just do a little bit of moving around and that'll build up over time. All right. That that's good advice. And, uh, it, it's definitely something that is, you mentioned that, that we're kind of beat up when we do jujitsu and it's a little hard to hit yeah. that full speed or, or, you know, with, with our full energy, uh, now might be the yeah. time to, to do that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just to reiterate on that, I think a point that's really useful for people to think about is the cool thing about doing that right now is that it's not just something that, well, I can do this because I can't train jujitsu. It's literally something that would massively help your jujitsu that you could not do when you're training jujitsu. So much so that I might even recommend to someone if it wasn't quarantine time that it might be worth it to them to just take off from jujitsu for two or three months or just do once a week and just really focus on their strength and flexibility seriously for two or three months. That's how important it is. So if you could see it that way, you could almost see this quarantine time as not even a loss of time, but just that you timed doing your strength phase well with the quarantine. Yeah, just a different time to focus. Mm hmm. Uh, you mentioned performance enhancers and, and having to compete against uh, people that may be doing those is the, uh, and I'm not an expert in this, uh, this field, but is the biggest advantage in being able to train like a crazy person and, and not have your body break down? Or is it actually the the minutes in the match being much uh, stronger? All of the above. All of it. It's all of the above. Yeah. It's, I mean, I would say one of the biggest things you notice when you roll with steroid people, I've rolled with a lot, uh, is, uh, in the gym a lot as well. Um, is that uh, the grip strength is unreal. Grip strength is something that like either A, you're just born with it. Uh, B, you are super into strength and conditioning and you do a ton of like grip strength work. Most people that I talk to who are high level jujitsu competitors, when you talk to them about exercise science, they have, they've never read anything. They know almost nothing. And when you talk to them, like, what's your lifting schedule? Like, Oh man, I just, you know, I do like bench and like squat, like, you know, like, like they don't even know what, what they're talking about really. Like they, and they don't take it that seriously. So when you roll with someone and their grip strength is just ungodly and like, there's no way to break it uh that's a big indicator as well as like i think balance and base is a big one because like uh when you do like bench squat deadlift you get really strong but there's a lot of like really small like stabilizer muscles that i think uh when you take steroids like everything gets stronger it's, it, it acts on the whole body right 
So like little things like like take like whatever muscle, you know, moves your your index finger up, whatever muscle is involved in that. Like you don't really work that often, but if you take steroids, it's going to make everything stronger. So often your grip strength and your balance and stability and core get so strong that people seem to have this unbelievable balance and base and unbreakable grips. That's like two of the biggest things I think that when I roll with like strong steroid users that I feel is like, wow, I always feel that. Right. Um, the other one is like, uh, how long they can push, right? People often think, oh, someone takes steroids. Therefore, you know, they're like, they're strong, but they're probably like bad cardio. It's like, no, Lance Armstrong was on a bunch of shit too. Right. Like I, maybe he wasn't on steroids. I don't know. Uh, maybe he was just EPO, but, but like, uh, those guys can go harder, longer. Right. So and then on top of that, yeah, they can train three times a day as well. So that's why I'm such a big proponent of like smarter training at lower intensity, because if I'm trying to get better at someone in chess, then, you know, if they're practicing chess two hours a day and I practice eight hours a day, all things being equal, I'm going to get better than them because I'm practicing more. The difficulty with jujitsu is that if the only way of practicing is going pohada every day, then you may only get two hours of training in and be absolutely dead, right? Because you train so much physically, your body's wiped. But I want to get eight hours in a day. So if I'm going to get eight hours in a day, it's just like running. Like you could uh, walk for five hours and it's it's doable. But if I told you to sprint at your absolute max, you could probably go for like 30 seconds before almost dropping from puking and you would be dead later in the day because you because of that, right? So – you know, it's the question is how hard do you go and what's your goal? If your goal is technical improvement, lower intensity, long training sessions with a lot of discussion and problem solving is what's going to make your technical level evolve. That's what you really should be focused on. And then do just enough really hard training so that you're peaking your cardio and strength. But if you look at all the science on it, how do people who run like a 5K train well, they don't go out two times a day and run their maximum speed for five kilometers <laughs> twice a day. Yeah, that's fucking really good. They don't even do it, but like once a month or something. Like they they they're very careful about overtraining and like they only peak on the tournament. Like there's a lot of science behind this. But in jujitsu, people think that like exercise science doesn't apply to them, and they just go batshit crazy, uh, like all day, you know. And and then they have to use performance enhancers to make up for that. And it's hard because a lot of gyms. If you try to take this like kind of tactical uh, mental approach, a lot of like gym culture is like, oh, you're a pussy. You're a fucking pussy if you do that. Right. Which is really funny because the whole premise of jujitsu in the first place was Elio Gracie fighting these big, strong judokas and beating them with technique that they developed more or less in the garage. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like the Gracie way today even though the Gracies aren't really into modern sport jujitsu, but to me, like the the Gracie philosophy way today is to you know do some like garage training or quarantine training, thinking very in depth, watching a lot of video, and spending all day trying to come up with clever tactical solutions to problems, not going in and going psycho hard all the time. There's a a book you mentioned, Lance Armstrong, called The Secret Race, and it's. Uh... Tyler Hamilton kind of tells his story and he was one of his teammates and th there's a point in time in the, in the book while, they, while they're racing, it's the tour de France and, and Lance just takes off going uphill or, you know, in some situation where everyone is exhausted and Lance just like coasts up Goes. this hill and, and they all thought it was hilarious. Like, it, like clearly he's on, steroids it's like nobody does that that's 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 in your d description of uh crazy grip strength and, and some of these these key indicators um do you think it's it, it's like they all knew what they were seeing wasn't real um yeah is that i don't know i don't know where i'm going with that question it just it reminded me of where, where you said we were talking about the yeah, grip strength I mean, being a key indicator not, of something not not I, not real I, I, I would say it's not always, but like often it could be right. I, I think the thing is like, you know, there's some people that are mega athletes, right? Like Usain Bolt, right? I don't know. The guy probably doesn't even use anything. I, maybe he does. I don't know. But, but obviously either way, Usain Bolt is like a 0. 0.00001% uh, athlete. He's a mega athlete. Alec, my former roommate, Alec Balding, you probably yeah. know Alec. Yeah. Yeah. 
like Alec is a mega athlete. Like he was born that way. The first time I ever met him, he had never lifted a day in his life. He was this little kid or he's, I mean, he's probably like 18 or something when I met him. He's like, Hey guys, just really calm and nice. And he was on ungod- like never break a grip. He's mega strong. We take him to the gym to try deadlifts. He like deadlifted like 450 pounds. His first time. <laughs> never even touched a weight in his life. He's like, okay, you just lift it. Like that's just how Alec is. Right. And like, he is just uh, like super gifted. <clears throat> But he would never use anything. But I could see someone maybe rolling with someone like him and being like, oh, dude, this guy's on something. But he's definitely not. I guarantee that. It's just that he was born that way. But uh, uh, most people are not born that way. And I think that you can tell when you see pictures of a guy and he kind of like looks like, wow, he looks like a normal human you know he just looks normal. Uh, and then all of a sudden now he's just like mega athlete. That, that doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah, bumped into Alec at uh, ADCC. Very nice. It was nice to meet him. And uh, yeah, it, it, could you? I mean, that would be crazy to be uh, quarantined with somebody like that <laughs> and, and get this this cra- crazy training while while it's going on. Um, yeah, yeah. It, I I don't know. So so, what do you think? While we're on this kind of steroid topic, there there are some people or organizations that are just like fine with it and just hey, um, go for it. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, there's an ethical question. I don't think there's anything wrong with someone using steroids uh, per se. If someone is in their own private life, decides they want to use steroids, that's totally cool. Like that, like they're not hurting me. That's okay. Um, if, if there's a tournament that says that it is illegal to use performance enhancers, right? Uh, and we don't know all the long-term effects of that. Uh you know, it, it could cause cancer. Uh, it, it could cause like heart problems, growth of your organs, like with all the stuff people are doing, you know, and even if like someone just uses like what, what someone would call a safe amount, right? Someone else could go to an insanely not safe level with EPO, steroids and all these performance enhancers. So you could certainly go to a level that's super not safe. And then basically what you're doing is you're making it where if you want to compete fairly in your sport, you have to put your own life at risk to be able to compete with an even playing field. And that's silly, right? Now, if if there's an organization uh, that says, uh, you know, hey, we don't care. Everyone can use whatever. That's fine. Go for it. I'm actually cool with that because I'm just not going to compete in it, right? Or maybe I will, but then I'm not going to complain that my opponent was on steroids because I know they can be on steroids. Um, but the problem is that these people, they won't, most of them won't admit they're on steroids, so what they they want the glory of being on uh, of not using without admitting that they are using a lot of these guys I see make posts. Yeah, I've even seen some of these guys blast other people for getting caught with steroids, knowing that they themselves are on steroids. So, I mean, that's like another level of like narcissistic maniac um, and. So, yeah, so I don't think there's anything wrong inherently with using steroids. I do think there's something wrong with using it when you're fighting someone else under a rule set that says you're not allowed to use that at that point. Like those people are just backwards rationalizing to themselves that it's okay to do it. But in the other sense, if you're like at a tournament that says we're pro steroid use, then if you're a non steroid user and you choose to compete in that competition, you cannot complain because that was the rule of the competition. So don't do it, you know? Yeah, it, it, <laughs> it that all makes sense. And then the uh, if you, if you haven't read the Secret Race, like everything, I think that they they were just further ahead technology wise. Like you're saying, uh, just people don't want to accept exercise science as a thing. Like uh, the 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 bike racing was was cutting edge as far as steroids because it's it's just about your muscle, how much you weigh, how much pain you can endure. And then repeat. <laughs> that's how bike yeah. racing. That's if you're good at like one of the key things to being good about riding a bike is how much pain you can endure. That's that's a key Ooh. thing. Like uh, the the guy who wrote the book, uh, Tyler Hamilton, he he fell on his bike. He I think he broke his. Sh- he did something to his shoulder. He finished the race and he ground down his teeth. He ruined some of his teeth because he was in so much pain gritting. It's like. Okay, that's crazy. But they're just they were or whatever so far ahead as far as technology and steroids and having some really impressive doctors that could that could give you the amount to hide it and all this these different techniques that they had developed. See, that's something like di- digging into on like a uh, 
psychological level trying to understand like that's something that's like really hard for me to grasp because like especially the older i get uh when i was younger it was like winning a world title like meant everything right like winning a world title at black belt and i still really very much want to win one this was like supposed to be my year back and then the, all this crap happened but uh but also as i've gotten older i also realize like OK, the, what I really want out of my life is to be happy. I think that's what everyone should want. And I don't mean happy just like like you're, you're happy because you're out partying. I mean, like deep rooted, like well-being in my life. I just want to be happy. Right? I want to live a happy life right now. Jiu-Jitsu is very important to me. It's like my art. It's like my chosen uh, craft for my life that I chose. And it means a lot to me. So I want to be as good as I can be. And I want to do the best Jiu-Jitsu that I could do. But also, I don't want to have to lie to people. I don't want to have to feel like I cheated someone else. I don't want to do all that stuff because I know that's going to lead me to be a less happy person, right? Um, now, I think a lot of these people, uh, like when you look at what's the, why do you need to be number one at something? That That's an interesting question, right? Because it's like, why do you need to be the world champion black belt in jiu-jitsu? Okay, the, the only reasons are uh, money could be one because you want to, you know, you know if you win that world title, it's going to be easier to make a financial living from this. That's one reason. Another reason is because uh, it's some sort of like deep rooted thing to yourself to prove like that you have what it takes, et cetera. Okay. And another one is fame. You just want to be famous, right? Because and everyone to be like glorify you. Okay. Well, if it's money, there's plenty of ways to get money and that's really not the easiest one by far. And you can still make plenty of money without doing that. Look at BGJ Fanatics, Jason, uh, uh, Grappler's Guide. Like, you know, so it's not like money is a really good reason to do that. Okay. And then fame. Maybe. Sure. Yeah. If you have fame, th there's a lot of cool things that come with that. But also, I don't think that's like a very noble cause that's going to bring you uh, long rooted uh, self-sustaining happiness is fame. Right. So then the other one is like some sort of deep rooted thing to yourself and about what the craft means to you. Right. And if that's the other one, then I would for me having to lie to everyone, how to lie to my family or admit to my family that I'm cheating and like, you know, doing all this stuff that would kind of undermine that in itself. So it seems to me my goal should be to maintain my ethics and be as good at jujitsu as I could be while not sacrificing my integrity. And if I end up not number one, winning a world title at black belt, or I'm number three, or I'm really damn good, but I just never quite won the world title. But then I find a way to make a good living online teaching jujitsu, and I'm smart with the rest of my money and invest well, and I live a happy life. And I, I can look at my kids one day, and you know, if they ask me about performance enhancers, I can honestly tell them the truth. And like that's going to lead me to a happier life in the end. And that's kind of my whole thought process. So when I see these people using steroids so much to try to win, uh, it used to frustrate me more. Now I just see kind of pity because I know the world that they're creating for themselves in their head. Yeah. Well, wow, that's an interesting uh, way, way to look with it. And you've you've uh, kind of evolved your thinking about competition and the value of of winning major titles <laughs> like a very insanely difficult to do uh but you still have that goal but you I, I, it's interesting to to listen to an athlete discuss uh priorities in life and, and and what's happening there and and i do see you have a lot of uh value in helping those around you and your students and you're you're doing a lot of stuff online as well like um with your youtube channel and I've I've learned a ton from you um, from that as far as just like oh I you know you subscribe so that way <laughs> that way this stuff pops up automatically and you say oh what's he doing today and then you, I get to watch and, and learn from you as 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 well are you is that pretty rewarding to to put stuff on YouTube and and help people oh all yeah yeah for sure um, something I'm really starting to like a lot more now is actually doing live streams because like I think. Uh, when I do YouTube videos, one of the things I like to focus on is like systems because people often learn techniques, but techniques, uh, you know, don't exist in isolation. So like I can show you here's an arm bar, but then as soon as you go for it, the guy's going to give you a different response to defend it. So you kind of need to understand four or five moves at the same time to actually make a system work. So I find it to often be more beneficial to help people to give them a system overview rather than, um, uh, rather than uh, just a singular technique. So I'm like, hey, 
there here's a whole five move set that explained with not mega deep detail, but just explained in like the course of like four or five minutes, organizing everything together so you can see how it all interconnects and you can fill in the gaps later uh, for yourself or I'll I release more specific content as well. Um, but that format seems to help people a lot. And, and I love doing that. I love doing the system overviews on the YouTube. But actually something I really enjoy doing is Q&A uh, because I feel like for each individual, uh, for people to learn something, it always starts with them, not the coach, right? So I can show you an arm bar. And if you're like a robot where you're like, yes, this is the arm bar. I am going to drill this. And like you're like a robot and you're not asking questions yourself and trying to seek to understand from your own perspective, uh, then you're never really going to get good. So in that sense, no matter what someone's question is or no matter how quote unquote stupid a question is, it's not really stupid because it's the first step in the correct direction. Like even if someone asks me a question like, um, you know, what's the best guard pass, which normally would like make me rip my hair out. Cause it's like a <laughs> ridiculous question. Right. But, that question is very important for that person because that's going to elicit the response from me of explaining why the idea of what's the best guard pass doesn't make sense. And then I have to explain to them how to approach jujitsu as a whole, uh, which is like, you know, well, rather than thinking what's the best guard pass, you should be approaching them thinking, you know, what's their body positioning and what's uh, some options I could do from here. And then you develop off of that. And that's so, and then as you develop, you're going to de develop counters for each thing. And we go into that. So even these like seemingly ridiculous questions will allow me to shed light on the person and transform the way they see it in general. And that is way more rewarding to me because I love interacting with people on that level. And that's something that you get out of doing a live stream that you can't get out of uh, just doing a video. Yeah. So, so where is it, live stream? Is it, is it, you're talking about like webinars? Uh, well, yeah, I do that, that in webinars. Uh, I do that in webinars. Uh, when I do a webinar, it's more that I go over a, a specific topic really in depth. So I'll go over like, you know, a, a new collar sleeve system that I have invented. Uh, and then I'll like run through the rough overview of the system, have them drill it. I watch them through Zoom and then I have them spar. I coach them while they spar and they can troubleshoot. And that's like two hours of Q&A back and forth on a specific position. When I do like a live Q&A on YouTube, that's more broad. So that's like if people can ask any okay. question they want and I'll have a partner with me. And sometimes it's like a. Uh, a verbal thing and I can just explain, you know, two or three minutes, like uh, kind of like I'm talking to you when you ask a question or if they ask a technical question, I can go in depth technically to solve that as well with like a partner. And that's fun for me because it's interactive and I know I'm, I'm really making a strong impact on multiple individuals, you know, but it's harder to scale of course, because I can't answer everyone's question. Yeah. That <laughs> I, I like your, uh, just your broad example. What's the best guard pass? It's and then <laughs> how you deal with that is probably more important than how you actually give them an answer. As far as uh, the the they really want to know what pass should I be learning now, or they want a shortcut learning passes that are going to work for them. They, they have a, a different question, but really. Um, that's not how jujitsu works. <laughs> like, Correct. Exactly. And if their question, uh, if basically, if they ask that question and I have to like stonewall that question and explain to them that their question is coming from the wrong place, that's great because that's probably the most important thing for their journey in jujitsu, right? My, my job is to make them better at jujitsu, not to show them a technique per se. So if someone asks me a question, I get a lot out of those ridiculous questions because it allows me to restructure the way they're seeing it. Because if I can restructure the way they see it, that's going to have a compound uh, effect on how they progress over the next year or two years training because they're going to have a different lens when they're training in general. You mentioned that <clears throat> the... Uh, the student needs to be kind of, uh, I don't know what the, the the phrase you said, interesting quote, but like uh, needs to be interested in this and, and it needs to come from that. Not the student. I think you said not the teacher. Hey, today we're doing arm bars. That's what you're going to do. Yeah. Uh, I, that is, that's definitely how I've 
perceived you picking up jujitsu. You mentioned, uh, you know, reverse engineering an arm bar from watching the UFC. That was interesting. You wanted to learn that. And then you had, uh, you have a lot of time where you and your training, I think you mentioned in a past interview, you train, uh, you know, with a roommate a lot and you learned a lot with just a, like stuff that you were interested in. Uh, do you run into students that don't have that, that just want to be, uh, hey, coach, what, what do I need to learn today? What are we doing? Or Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I reiterate all the time with my students. I try to set the culture of self-learning. I'm always reiterating that with them. Uh, that's also largely why I, I don't know if I'll ever want to own a gym. Maybe I will. But that's why I like the format of online instruction is because I just I explain my truth the way I see things and people take it or leave it. So if I have a student that uh, does not like if they don't have that interest then I don't have an interest in them and I don't mind, you know, I have an infinite amount of uh, patience and ability to want to help people who want to be helped, who want to learn. But when someone's just like, just tell me what to do and they want to turn their brain off, I'm, I'm not going to work with them. And that's okay. That's for them. They can find another coach. I don't mind. Uh, but like I, um, I, I always try to guide them towards understanding. What do you want? You want to be better. If I show you a random arm bar, of course, like I'll show people techniques. I give people co- like, but the, the reality is in modern day, there's so much content online. Me showing a random technique in person or me showing it on YouTube is the same thing, right? So it, it, the only difference when I'm in person is you can ask questions, which goes back to the original idea of that person taking control of their own learning. So um, when I'm in class uh, what, with my morning crew, usually what I do is I come in and then for the warm up, we do 20 minutes of light rolling to warm up. Everyone just kind of flows around, gets loose. And then after that, I'll show one technique that's uh, that it's just optional. It's just it's ideas. It just goes, hey, guys, here's a cool idea I've been working on. I show it for like five minutes with a couple of different ideas. I go, you can work it if you want. If you have something else you want to work on, work on that. And then we do 30 to 40 minutes of specific sparring and then some regular sparring at the end. Are you, uh, is it the specific sparring? They, hey, today I'm, this is what I'm working on. Or do, does the whole class work on the same back control? No, they work on whatever they okay. want. Okay. Yeah, very self. You mentioned that self-directive. Um, so here, the idea of having students rolling and learning and 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 being in charge of that culture. How how often do you not roll and just watch your students train with each other? So uh, if I'm trying to do my own training. Uh, I don't like to coach. It's if I'm gonna if I'm in class and I'm gonna deliver a good class and help people, I can't train myself. It's very hard for me um, because I feel that once I start training, I'm focused on my own improvement, my own learning, or my or I'm being competitive, whatever. I'm now in a different headspace, and I. Uh, I just go deep on whatever it is that I do. So if I'm trying to solve this, like this uh, pass in the collar sleeve and the guy's like doing something that's giving me a hard time, he's like knee shielding there. And like, I'm in this like deep think tank trying to understand how to solve this. I'm like coming up with ideas and testing them. I'm like, I'll go for like two or three hours straight without stopping. And like, and I just, I'm obsessed with it when I do it. Uh, When I get in that mode, I'm not, uh, it's hard for me to be in that like, coming up with an idea and then someone comes up and they're like, Hey John, why, why do I get my guard passed? It's just very difficult for me to snap out of truck. Cause then it's like that question for me to give a, a response that I would be satisfied giving to that student. I would need like five minutes or something to really dig in their head and try to, to solve that. Um, and I have a lot of patience for that when I'm in coach mode, but if I'm training, it's really hard to do that. So whenever I'm teaching a class that I like to either have like the first 30, 40 minutes of me being in coach mode. After that, I start training and then I, I'm not really helping people. I'm just focused on myself because I find like doing it in between becomes like terrible for both parties. Like then I give like shorter answers that like kind of leave them feeling like I didn't want to help or I uh, give them more of an answer. But then I get frustrated in my own positions because I can't solve it. Yeah, I the the I think the most clear example of these the different modes, and and I'm terrible at this. Like I just 
I, I don't own my gym. I'm not a, uh, I'm a black belt. I sometimes will help people a little bit like coaching or whatever. I'll teach a technique, but I'm not running the class, but yeah. I, I always am. If I sit out around, I'm always amazed at how important that is to do occasionally to, to, to watch the students train with each other, to, to help them make sure everyone's having good, good sessions and that no one's, you know, uh, training in a way that's unproductive and i, I look at uh john danaher he doesn't he doesn't roll and i like that's not a bug that's a feature like one of the one of the best coaches is watching the students all of the time like he's not on the mats uh rolling with them i i used to think that's kind of weird no that's probably uh a feature of, of some of the great coaches as far as they're controlling the culture they're controlling the room better does that make sense yeah Absolutely. I mean, if your job is to be a coach, you can't like, like what you're supposed to be like going really hard with someone and like, <laughs> you know, like, like super out of breath, like it's super competitive and it's like fucking war mode. And then like, you're, then like you need to snap out of that and then like give someone a really in-depth answer, be fun. And like, it's just, it's just really hard. Yeah. It, there. Yeah. It's, that's interesting. And I, I need to, to to often sit out more and to to watch and to play that role just as a part time basis. But it's jiu jitsu is so fun. <laughs> it's like I just want to train and roll uh, when I can, or or spar, or uh, you know, just I don't know. That's that's my thing as well. Is like I don't get to train as much as I want to. So when I'm there, I want to make the most of it every time. Yeah, for sure. So uh, where can where can people go to connect with you if they're not already uh, connected and, and that way they can learn learn from you? Uh, my my Instagram and my YouTube is John Thomas BJJ. Um, uh, those are the main locations. Uh, and then if people want any form of like online coaching, I do offer uh, uh, online private instruction as well as webinars. And uh, you can always reach out to me on my Instagram at John Thomas BJJ and message me if you're interested in that. Cool. And where's your actual school? Uh, it's Fighter Center. It's located in Gothenburg, Sweden. So that's where I live now is in Sweden. I was actually planning on making a uh, U.S. tour in like the uh, East Coast and West Coast uh, for seminars, but that's not happening now. So I'll be here for the foreseeable future and we'll see what happens with the quarantine and stuff. Yeah, just delayed. <laughs> yeah, just delayed. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I, I really appreciate talking with you. We, we covered a uh, a lot of different topics and some else, <laughs> some people kind of want to know uh you know what's all on the table and, and bringing up some kind of more sensitive topics about steroids and that sort of thing i really appreciate you just yeah, we, yeah, we didn't discuss sure. talking that beforehand anyway but you were open book oh, yeah, and everything i, I, I appreciate that about steroids. there's no problem <laughs> <laughs> i'm not uh i'm not hiding from that topic <laughs> okay cool well uh, thank you so much for joining me today oh uh, no problem anytime i really enjoy having jonathan thomas on the podcast uh, we've got a, a couple other interviews with him. Go and check them out. I'll put links to those in the show notes, of course. And uh, if we then obviously go follow him on social media. I really enjoy his YouTube channel. Uh, he puts a lot of great stuff up there. He's one of my favorite YouTube uh, people in the jiu-jitsu community. He's uh, very well-spoken, and he, he shows uh, things and explains them in a manner that connects with me very well. So go check out Jonathan on YouTube or any of his other uh, social media outlets. If you thought this interview or episode would be something that a friend would enjoy, please share that with them. This is how the podcast is able to grow, and uh, it really means a lot to us when you share the podcast. Uh, guys, we have an article of the week, uh, you know, this week, kind of a normal thing we do. 18 things I wish I knew before I ran my first half marathon. And we often pull in non-jujitsu topics and we kind of talk about them in a jujitsu way. That way, uh, we kind of outside the box thinking and, and we learn from other sports. But I recently signed up for a half marathon that's only in a couple Another weeks. Another one? I've, I've, it's been years since I've done any long distance running. I did, I think, I, I think I did two half marathons and then a full. And I haven't ran anything over 10 miles since I've done the full probably five or six years ago. But I just feel like without being able to grapple on a regular basis because of the COVID-19 outbreak, 
I need to have something to push me a little bit more than just uh, having my dog to go run with, <laughs> which is which is fine. But I really need to run more than a mile or two, I think, to to get a good workout. So uh, my wife had this idea; she's going to do it with me. We're both running a half marathon uh, towards the end of April, and uh, it's going to be canceled. No, it's it's uh, it's a it's a e race or whatever it's called when you. Um, you just do it at home, and then you send them your results. So, oh yeah, Joe and I are going to do that too. I bet we'll, uh, we'll set the record, won't we, Joe? Yeah, something yeah. like that. Hey, Joe, look up to see what the record is, and uh, you know, half marathon, and you know, we'll shave a, uh, you know, a couple seconds off when we send our send our results in. Nice. Yeah, well, sure, sure we will, because all that hard training we're doing. You got that right. <laughs> well, I just needed. I, I know you know Gary's naturally motivated to to get after it, but without jujitsu, I needed something to kind of push myself a little bit more. And uh, I think this was a pretty simple outlet for me to do while in quarantine or quarantine while in social isolation. So I like, hey, let's see what if I can learn anything here from this article. <laughs> and the first tip they have is slow down, pace yourself, it's, and that's great for jujitsu. When you start jujitsu, I. Everyone's probably very similar, very excited about it. And you just want to go all the time. Your brain's always thinking about jiu-jitsu. You're listening to, ju- to jiu-jitsu podcasts, and everything is kind of just ex- is a crazy moment. If you can slow that down a little bit and, and train at a rate that your body can sustain and and just just maintain a reasonable pace. With with running, if you hit, hit it too hard uh, or... Um, you, you try to actually run too fast, you, you're not going to get that sort of a distance in. Or if you hit it too aggressively and you're running too, f- that's my issue is I want to keep pushing my distance because I know that this uh, distance is going to be uh, difficult for me. So I want to run some longer runs, but I need to kind of earn up to that first. Uh, that way I'm not injuring myself before I get up there. Byron, I'm going to take point two. have fun. Um, that's my big thing I always talk about in jiu-jitsu. Uh, we need to have fun. It's it's a hobby um, for the majority of us. Same thing with uh, running half marathons. It's a hobby for most people. Uh, you know, there are some people who are professional racers, professional jiu-jitsu people, and, you know, then it's a job. But um, for me, jiu-jitsu is all about having fun. When I'm having fun, I'm going to show up a lot more. I'm going to make more friends. I'm going to be more of an asset to my team. I'm going to be happy and I'm going to learn more. So um, remember, it's a hobby. It's a fun sport, you know, while you're running or while you're doing jujitsu. But uh, don't forget to have fun. Yep, that's definitely key, Gary. I'm going to skip down. There's a lot of points here. We can go back and forth, but I'm going to skip down a few to uh, it says beat that quitting feeling. And I remember the first time uh, I ran more than a mile or so, and that might sound weird to you guys, but when I was younger, I swear, I just, I just couldn't run. And mostly it was because I tried to run too fast. And I'd get to a point where it just hurt like hell, and I'd just say, screw this. And the, I remember the first time I got past that point, and I realized it's just about, um, you know, s- slowing down and finding that sustainable pace and then continuing it and you get through the point where it sucks and you keep going it's like okay it, it kind of sucks but i can keep doing this for a while and uh man that was a big breakthrough for me and i think the same is is true in grappling i think that uh you see a lot of guys like at the end of the class maybe you've got 40 minutes or so that's dedicated towards op- to open rolling and man a lot of us don't go every single round and it's kind of because we think we can't but you really can. You just find a sustainable pace and you keep going. And I think that's key to to maybe distance running. I don't know a lot about distance running, but I think that's key to grappling. When you get to that open mat where you can train for an hour, two hours, three hours, you can train for that entire time if you find the right pace and just stick with it. I, I want to hit the point about uh, learn about recovery. And this is going to be a big one for me for the actual running and it's also important for jujitsu. So with the running, if, if I just ignore my recovery process, I go out, I run eight miles, come home and hop in the shower and eat breakfast. 
that's not really what I should be doing. I'm, I'm also including uh, yoga, and I'm trying to become more flexible, and it's actually working, guys. I've gained quite a bit of flexibility <laughs> in a pretty short amount of time. I'm really, really happy with how that's going. Who would have thought that if you would stick with it for a few weeks, it would actually pay off? I, I feel like an idiot for saying like that's like I'd never have stuck with it. It's just not as enjoyable as jujitsu. So it's just hard for me to stay motivated with yoga, but just build it into my routine, uh, go out, run, and then work on my flexibility for 20 minutes. And then that's good. But you know, flexibility or yoga isn't just the recovery process. There's, uh, you know, they talk about ice baths and nutrition and, and, and all this stuff and sleep and all these different things that really matters because if I can't go train or, or run the next day or my next scheduled day, I'm going to fall behind the schedule. And for me, it's coming up pretty quick here. Uh, we don't have a long training camp to, for me to get this marathon or half marathon done. It's going to be uh, here before I know it. But same thing with jujitsu. If you're training, uh, I would say usually my training, when, when I go, I, I train, about half my rolls are pretty tough and about half of them are at a more relaxed pace. I don't really need to do a recovery process when I get home or I don't really need to do a recovery process the next day even. Like I'm pretty good. But if I have a hard training session, if if I roll several good rounds with Joe or Gary and, and, uh, um, and I'm kind of beat up after the end of that, I probably need to take a little bit of time and, and work on my recovery process so I'm able to function the next day in, in a way that I'm happy with. Welcome to the BJJ Brick and Part-Time Yoga Podcast. I'm here <laughs> with our resident our resident yogi, Byron Shapara. <laughs> hey, I can almost touch my toes. <laughs> hey, man, I, I stumbled across uh, what I think might be a secret for flexibility, at least for me, and that's uh, the little... Um, Oh, what do you call that spider walk in your hands or whatever? You know, when you're grappling, you've got an underhook and you want to move their arm and you just sort of walk your fingers a little bit on the mat. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So that works with flexibility, too. I told you guys to have matching tat or not matching, but similar tattoos on my shins. And I'm using that for measuring to increase my flexibility. And earlier today, I was bent over and I put my hands on my legs and I just t- took a few breaths and then I I walked my fingers down about a quarter of an inch and relaxed and took a few more breaths and walked my fingers down. I swear I, I gained about an inch and a half uh, range of motion. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, how, how, how simple, but I never thought about it before. Uh, I'm so proud you gained an inch and a half there, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. hey, my wife tells me that's a big deal. Uh Back to the article, guys. Uh, <laughs> Who thought Gary bring it back to topic? <laughs> yeah, Joe's got me blushing over here. Um, but uh, um, hey, check your ego. That's a huge one in jujitsu. Uh, sounds like it's a huge one in um, running too. Running and talks about hey, it doesn't matter if some you know some big guy passes you, some lady in a stroller passes you. You know you're winning just for showing up. You're trying to better yourself. Um, jujitsu the same way. Uh, you know, I've talked about it numerous times. I didn't learn the way I should have in my first couple of years because when it came to rolling, I always tried to win. And uh, when you're doing that, you're, you're not going to learn. And once I got out of that ego part, I, I did start learning, uh, you know, started getting better. Um, but let's go back to running real quick. I do have a funny story. Um, besides when me and Joe are about ready to get to break the, the record here on that race we're about ready to do, the half marathon. Only once have I ran in a race, and I ran a 10K one time. And it was a local called River Run here. And I'm going with my boss who uh, actually ran cross country in college, so I figure I'm going to get destroyed. But I didn't care. I was just uh, out there to run. But so I start running and, and start out fast, like Byron was talking about some mistake and running along pretty good and finally break. I didn't break out of, uh, you know, the cluster, I guess, about a mile into it or a couple miles into it. And next thing I know, here comes a lady pushing a double stroller with kids in it just blew by me like I was standing still. <laughs> and I just remember at that point I was like, what am I doing here? Um, but you know, I just kept running and just laughed to myself, uh, and just thought, man, that lady's incredible. Yeah, that's, I, I fully expect to see that at, um, the last time I did a marathon I, or a half marathon, uh, I trained for it a little bit more and I was doing about a two hour pace. I expect it will take me longer to run this than that. 
But it, oh, I, I guess it. I'm alone here. I was just me and my wife running yeah. this thing. There's no one going to pass us because no one else is running with us. But w- w- when I was doing those at that pace, um, people were with me who I was surprised by. I'm not um, super fit. I, I'm an average size guy. I'm like uh, 170 pounds. But there were people who were a lot chubbier than me that were running right next to me the whole time. I'm like, man, this is, they're impressive. Well, they're just in good shape. They, they haven't, uh, lost the weight or whatever, but they were, they were, uh, I was impressed, but it's just, they have that, they have the, the lungs and the heart and they just, they, they, they train hard for it, but I don't know. It's the same, same thing is like, how's this guy keep it up with me? How's that guy pass me? He's got, he's got 50 extra pounds on him or whatever. And here I am struggling. <laughs> How is she pushing that stroller with twins in it, Gary? I don't know. I actually, when she passed me, and first I just started chuckling to myself. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. But then uh, I actually tried to keep up with her. So I increased my pace. You know, I was like, I'm not going to let her pass me. She buried me. I I, <laughs> I mean, and she wasn't even trying. I, I couldn't <laughs> keep up with her. Uh, that's funny, Gary. Gary, you should think about doing something like that again, maybe a bike race. I know you're, you're on your bike a lot. And just do one that's uh, online and uh, sign up for it, support a charity. I know you're a very charitable guy. And uh, get out there and push yourself a little bit. You know, I was thinking of supporting uh, Gary and Joe's uh, Tiger Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah. That's your charity. That's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. We, we got a tag team event coming up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good luck, my friends. Uh, yeah, I th- this, is, this is a fun article. or it's, I guess it's good for me to see and... I think we pulled some good information from it. I'll put a link to it, uh, to the website there. It's runtothefinish.com uh, is the name of the website. So thank you guys for uh, sharing that with us. Hey, and, Byron, real quick. Yes. What's the date of that E half marathon? Um, it's on the uh, April 25th. Okay. So I want everybody to realize on April 25th, Joe and I are setting the half marathon record. We're going to be one and two. Joe, we'll flip a coin to see who gets to be number one. I'm so good. I'm going to do it without ever leaving my couch. Yeah, I mean, we're, <laughs> we're going to. What we'll do is we'll take a before picture and then we'll dump a bucket of water on our heads and take an after picture. All right. Yeah. So, a couple well, record breakers here. I hope to get into a little bit better shape between now and then. <laughs> uh, I, I'm actually going to run the course, Gary. I've got a a half marathon course identified here around where I'm at. I just need to find out where the bus stops are and then I'm, <laughs> and then I'm ready to go. <laughs> a couple of restaurants or bars along the way. You'll be safe. Well, I was thinking, I know they have a 5k or a 10k coming up for, uh, you know, the, all the money goes to rabies to find a cure for rabies. So I think I might do that one. Sweet. Yeah. All right. Well, gentlemen, it's been, uh, it's been fun and, uh, yeah, if you want to train with us, you could find Gary and I in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, Joe is located in Lake Jackson, uh, Texas. That's just south of Houston. Uh, send us yep. a, just, a message on Facebook, my friends. Just be sure and have your hazmat suit and all your PPE. Yeah, that's true. Once this uh, whole thing is over, we, we'd love to train <laughs> with you guys. Anybody, yeah, I don't think anybody's going to be training with us for three or four months. But, when, uh, once this is over, please yeah. come train with us. <laughs> yeah. Maybe uh, in 2022. So, uh, yeah. Man, hey, yeah, so, that's way out so, there. So, so real, real quick here, uh, before we get off the air, Byron, I noticed that Jake had some on some like online uh, lives with his students. What what kind of things are you guys doing to, to keep the students involved at your gym and keep things moving forward? Yeah, good good question. He's He's going to the gym. And uh, demoing some stuff uh, between basically uh, his son, who I don't know how old he is, uh, maybe five. five. Yeah, I just had his birthday. And, that and, and his wife, who's a blue belt. Um, th- th- they they show techniques. They, they like to go live. They like to show uh, like a, a a wide range of stuff. So kind of something for everybody. I've got on there and showed some stuff. Uh, I've done it from home. Uh, and and several other watched, coaches have. Yeah, Gary even good. tuned in. Yeah, it was good. I watched uh, Lowe's the other day uh, with Ellie and everything. That was good, too. I, pretty neat. Yeah, it's good to just kind of uh, be out there with with the community, even on a digital basis. 
um, yeah. let them know that I mean, the cool thing is like you doing it because it was you or if it's fox or if it's joe or you know fernando you know somebody that i know i'll watch like you know i could care less about uma plata to be honest with you and i learned from watching you uma plata so i thought that was neat like if somebody just put out a random uma plata video i wouldn't watch it but because it's you you know or if it was somebody i know i'll watch it and so i actually learned so uh awesome yeah that's nice. the i mean that's i'm the similar way watching uh jake so kid techniques or watching matt low show kid techniques like yeah i just miss those guys man <laughs> let's yeah. see how they're, they're doing good it's good to see them yeah yep how about like you how about you joe? joe yeah so so my coach uh he's always got a monthly plan so each day you know when you come in and train which position he's going to be teaching from so he sent out that calendar for the month of april uh, even though we're not having class, with a suggestion that each student each day watch at least one, I guess, YouTube or a portion of a, a instructional, if you have it, something that relates to that position, and then watch at least one black belt match a day. So, um, you know, there's other things you can do. But as far as study and learning, I thought that was a pretty good place to start from. You know what I thought was neat I saw today is it might have been before you, Byron, or before you, Joe, but if I remember when we had Eddie Fivey on the show uh, from Saratoga, New York, who uh, he was uh, the Hickson Cup. Yeah, I remember Eddie. Yeah. Well, I saw today, you know, he does, uh, you know, goes live on Zoom every day. But, you know, he'll start off with a little conditioning class. Then he'll do a regular 30-minute class, you know, probably just teach something. But what he does after that is film study. And I thought that was a pretty cool idea. Um, you know, you take me younger in my career and you have me watch stuff. I don't get anything. You know what I mean? I'm just watching. I might see the end result and, you know, the very, you know, dynamic things that are easy to see. But I'm going to miss a lot of stuff, a lot of little things. And, you know, that's what I thought was a cool idea about him doing a film study. You know, so I figured he's probably getting like, Joe, you posted Buchecha and uh, Hodger today. Like maybe he's, you know, using that and saying, hey, look what, look how, you know, Hodger dips his hip to put his weight here so Buchecha can't move. Look how Buchecha bumps to get this underhook so he can start his escape. But uh, I thought that was a pretty cool idea doing the film study with his, with his school. Yeah, and if anybody's looking for some additional content right now where you're shut up at home, um, I, I've kind of thrown this out a few times. The, uh, uh, is it Jiu-Jitsu Rewind? Grappling Rewind. Yeah, Grappling uh, Rewind. Yeah, so, so traditionally what they've done over the last three to five years, however long they've been doing a podcast, is they preview upcoming events and they cover events that have happened this week. Well, obviously, no events have happened for a while. And what they're doing right now is they're going back and the two hosts are watching historical matches throughout the week. And then they're covering those cool. matches. So, awesome. yeah, it, it's it's an awesome thing to listen to. If you're looking for more content, check them out. I cool. like that. So that's basically a film study right there. Yeah, I pretty like much. That. Guys, I've had a, a great time. Thank you, as always, for uh, recording with me. And thank the listener for hanging out with us as well and inviting us into their ears every week. Uh, I know we're all anxious to get back on the mats, but uh, find a way. Stay sweaty, my friends. And don't forget to wash your hands. Train hard. Uh, study some film. Do what it takes to get better, guys. We'll see you on the mats when this is over. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu.